what I'm going to talk about here today is actually a particular research-oriented topic on how to leverage cloud computing and using a big data paradigm to address some of the computational challenges that if we didn't take this kind of paradigm, if we didn't have the computational infrastructure available, uh, that we can't, we just can't, can't achieve that. And actually, I should also say that the research I'm going to present are mostly derived from um, a course called EECX 600, Cloud Computing Data Science, that um, had, I offered a couple of times in the, in the last several years. It was those students who participated in the class and using um, HPCC um, uh, High Performance Computing Center's Cloudera local cloud. We have a local cloud. It's not too big, and I, I think it, it's waiting to be expanded further. It has 30 nodes, um, but it's, it's already showing the acceleration speed up um, that we can achieve. So I encourage everybody to think about uh, those kind of resources in your own research, because if, if you think bigger, you, you, you can achieve um, better sort of impact using the computational resources that's already here. So I'm going to provide a quick review of how to use MapReduce to do cloud computing, what that is, and the particular kind of um, topic I'm going to talk about, which is ontologies in biomedicine, and uh, a simple mathematical theory called formal concept analysis, how to use that to drive the ontological analysis, and how to actually visualize and actually further and analyze mining the results we obtained. I was just actually flying back from um, San Francisco on red eye flight, so I'm, you know, hopefully by 30 minutes, 40 minutes, I can still standing here. Uh, but um, but some of those topics are, are uh, they described there, and I got feedback from s several of the colleagues saying that the the visualization interfaces we developed in the group, you know. They look beautiful. Okay, so that's not a small, you know, uh, kind of recognition, you know, by those researchers, leading researchers in the field, and saying that, that the the kind of visualization interface we have with respect to, to ontology, they really like it. So, these I, I want to cast this kind of research in the big data framework. And when we talk about big data, uh, the usual V's uh, are what you hear. It's about volume in the first place, and well, to be big data, your volume must be bigger than anything you can store you, on your laptop or desktop or, or something. You know, you can buy a couple of um, desktop RAID machines, but that's still not big data. It has to be, you know, stored there uh, in, 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 a, in a much larger data, data center place, and that, that becomes big data. Velocity. Um, that's the rate of the data that's been generated. Well, you tweet, you know, you go to YouTube. That's because you know thousands of users are simultaneously uploading information there, and and then tens of thousands of users downloading and view view that. So that kind of rate, you know, that's that's velocity. And actually, just across in the engineering school on campus here. Roger French's lab is, you know, um, acquiring sensory information for, from solar panels, and that's streaming data on the on the voltage and, and all sorts of information that, that that hopefully get better understanding of the longevity of those kind of uh, performance of solar cells. And the variety is actually um, related to complexity. It's one of the most intriguing aspect of of, of things. We have data of all sorts of different kinds. But if you look at it, there are basically three kinds of data. The first kind of data is what you can sort of put nicely on your Excel sheet, right? It's like a rectangle. Each column has a name and it has a value you can put in, and it's very well structured. That's called structured data. Then there are those data that's there that, that uh, you download from PubMed or IEEE uh, library and things like those are publications. That's semi-structured because the title may be not just exactly two words, maybe some you know 20 words long. The abstract can be shorter and longer, and the sections are not uniform and things like that. 
And each paper ranges from you know, five pages to, to 50 pages long, right? So that's called semi-structured data. And because there's, there's a loosely coupled kind of structure there, there's title, author, institution, things, but there's no fixed lens um, you know, for each of the field. And then um, the third kind of data is really gets him, uh, get him messy. If you look at pictures, right? Uh, images and things like that, where that's, that's not even semi-structured. And the way to differentiate the differences for each of the first ones, each cell, you know, each cell in the Excel sheet, each character in the publication, in the paper, it has a very defined meaning, right? And you can sort of, uh, you know, put them together and, and get a, you know, express a more complex kind of uh, phenomena. But for images, uh, videos, and uh, time series, you know, like your you know, blood pressure measurement, there's probably no single meaning that you can define for each of the data points. Each data point doesn't mean anything. It is aggregation of, of larger area, larger volume that makes sense of it. So that's the differentiation of the variety of different data. There, there are basically three different kinds, right? Um, but what I'm going to talk about the data, big data, is actually really not so much with respect to the first reviews. It is about the, the last two that are added, uh, in my own opinion. And that's very relevant, relevant to the university setting, the, the, the kind of research we do. We need a bigger vision, and that generates bigger value. Okay? So that's what, what really big data is. And actually, cloud computing itself is kind of big data thinking and a paradigm. So what we can do nowadays, this is how I'm going, you see two kind of uh, architecture diagram. Um, and so the cloud here is, is really back in some data center that we don't have to worry about you know, where the power comes from you know, and how is the cooling going and things like that. But then. You, on your desk, you know, on your own kind of network and then desktop machines and laptops, with the push of a button, you can actually access all of the power behind the cloud. And I also like the name cloud. You know, the, the more you think about cloud, the more sort of intuitive it becomes because, you know, the cloud is something when you walk around, it follows you, right? Rather, you follow the cloud. So it brings the computational power to you. And that's what a cloud is, okay? And um, one of the particular paradigm changes that cloud computing enabled us is what's called the map reduce kind of paradigm to do uh, parallel processing. The key idea, the basic idea of map reduce is that if you can form your computational tasks into sort of key value pair in, key value pair out in a sort of quite, uh, you know, um, structured way, whatever key value it is, and the value can be complex, can be a matrix and things like that, then you can leverage MapReduce and put, push that to, to our local HPCC Cloudera environment, and even push to Amazon um, Cloud Computing environment. And what I'm going to explain um, in, in, in the rest of the uh, sort of um, rest of the talk is to motivate the ontology, why we care about ontology, and then describe an um, approach that allowed us to reduce the computational time that took, in several years ago, it took three months to compute. With cloud computing, it only took three hours. And now we're looking to reduce that to a couple of minutes. Right. Once you can do that, you, you, you can address, you can tackle even bigger problems. You can ask bigger questions, so that's important, that you couldn't even imagine before. Okay? Just embolden yourself uh, with your you know, uh, thinking. So I want to motivate ontology by uh, asking you to look at uh, this picture uh, taken from uh, Science Friday, um, this program, they have a website and to ask you, what do you see in the picture? Yes? Ice cream. Ice, <laughs> ice cream cones, yes, that's a very good guess because you know, you have, uh, you probably have some chocolate uh, embedded with creams and things like that, right? So that's uh, where, that's, you know, so, so when, we, when I looked up 
Well, look at what, what this um, describing um, about picture. This is a passage that's describing um, the picture. I like this passage because it's a beautiful textual description and it's also something not a seven, seven year old can understand, right? I mean, it's really using very sophisticated uh, language to describe this phenomenon in a very precise way. So what you actually saw was the uh, insect bug, right, at, at, at that stage, okay? Well, how did you read in this passage and understand what the picture is? What goes through your mind, right? Where you go, it goes through your mind because when you read the text in any newspaper, any textbook even, even we communicate, we invoke in, we're invoking, um, you know, sort of seamlessly, effortlessly in our mind, the concepts, the entities we already learned and their relationships uh, they have. If I, you know, it's like if I mention car, you already know that it has four wheels and steering wheel and seats and things like that. I don't need to tell you that there are all the engine parts and things like that. So here, you know, if you, if you mention, in, you know, part about the cylinder is this respect color and shape, um, if, if you say two weeks, it's a time span, and the caption colors are vegetable that you can actually eat, and things like that. And, and actually, there are many connectivities that's, that's not explicitly described in the text itself, but it's outside of the text that the, when we communicate, when we read, we actually instantaneously bring those up and make our understanding. That's how understanding happens, right? So if if humans and um, you know, intelligent beings uh, communicate that way, where what, why not to make our systems more intelligent by also taking a similar approach? And that's why ontology becomes so prevalent in, in almost uh, all areas of information science, in, in particularly in health, IT, and, and, and those kind of areas. Because if, if we didn't empower those systems with the ontological scaffolding on top of it, then the computers are just reading like that. It's binary, right? It's just a bunch of binary bits, and, and, and you can't make sense of it. So it's really essential to sort of integrate ontology into any of the specific domain when we create any application tool. And this is a diagram sort of summarizes um, the kind of uh, systems uh, we developed in my group. And each one of the system, actually each of the apps, so your uh, PEEP, EPIDEA, and any of the acronyms represent actually a tool that we've developed. And we always sort of structure the architecture in two ways. We have the domain-specific data source that enters into the system, but then we have the ontological knowledge source that also enters the system that's specifically relevant to that domain. And this way, it's, it's, it's like we empower those computational applications and systems with sort of ontological knowledge so that, that they can actually um, process information, behave more um, intelligently. So now I haven't even talked about what the ontology is. We're not going to get the precise definition of what it is as long as you have intuition of what it is. Basically, it's actually, um, you know, the, the academic discipline of ontology is the philosophical study of the nature of being, what exists today, how do we describe it? And it's a classification of things. You have substance in the most general sense, and then you have material substance and the immaterial substance, and then you can go down with, you know, um, animate, you know, so, so it's a classification of things, and that's the entity when even each one of you learn a spe specific subject area, you're sort of building that kind of structure in your brain, and then when you read or you com com communicate, you actually automatically link to that, and that's part of the learning process, and ontology is really to make that explicit, okay? And one of the largest and well-known ontological systems for bio biomedicine is actually called a unified medical language system. And that's maintained by National Library of Medicine um, at the Bethesda. And um, it, it consists of uh, you know, uh, you know, 
millions of concepts, um, uh, hundreds of different systems, ontological systems on, for specific domains, and then there's a linkages about uh, those different categories of things. So if you look at the, the, the subsystems within UMS, uh, we have the SNOMAS CT, we have GEO, Jing Ontology, we have um, MESH somewhere. So these are the things that actually all integrated together into one kind of system so that when you download and use it, you can download the entire system or then extract components of it and things like that. And what I'm going to focus in, uh, uh, in the remainder of the uh, talk is SNOMAS CT. It's, uh, it's actually owned by WHO, a sub subsidiary of WHO, and each, many of the major countries uh, have their own specializations and localizations because of their specific kind of ways of nomenclature of addressing uh, different things. We have actually a US version also that's released twice a year uh, by N NLM. So when we have those kind of systems there, I mean, do you know how those systems are created? They're created by actually a long history, you know, decades uh, of evolution. And, and some of the components are very manual. Other components are automatic, and the, they are fused and integrated together. And if you look at one of the particular example from Slomas CT, it may look like that. And you have the classification of chin injury, facial laceration, and you have simple laceration of chin, complex laceration of chin, and things like that. So one of the ways of, uh, for the purpose of the analysis of ontology is to actually discover what might be some errors and missing concepts and things like that, misaligned concepts, because these, they are so important in, in each application, and it's better to inf ensure their quality Okay, and continues to improve their quality. So this, this diagram actually, if you look at, you know, there seems to be a missing entity in the middle because simple laceration, complex laceration, there, there's, why don't you call something laceration of chin and that makes things easier. And then it goes to, still goes to top. So it's missing some concept that naturally should be there. And this is the kind of things that um, we're set to discover. And so in general, ontological systems are often incomplete, not where step specified, and it's not static because the scientific knowledge evolves. So for many different reasons, we need to continuously monitor and curating um, enhanced ontology, and that's just a natural process. And indeed, you know, that's why we have different versions twice a year of release of Sonoma CT, for example, and each re revision, uh, something got changed. And to, to actually, one of the things, I mean, one of the tools that we can use to analyze the change, to understand the change, is called formal concept analysis. That goes back to my uh, PhD dissertation kind of area is using those kind of ordered structure to to, anal to understand the the sort of properties of what is presented and then to detect if there are anomalies if there are areas that that that's suitable for further enhancement. So, in just a couple of sentences, I can actually describe to you what a formal concept analysis framework is. So basically, you have a lower-level classification kind of matrix. It's a binary matrix, so you can sort of separate things into objects and attributes. So objects here, we have the, uh, some num integers, right? Attributes are the properties about the integers. You have even, odd, composite, and then you can just say which one is which. Well, by Having that to, as an input, and if you invoke formal concept analysis, you actually get the diagram. This is a lattice diagram on the lower right part. And actually, each node becomes a concept. And that's a formalization of a concept. And that, it has two sides. For each node, if you go upwards, you see actually all of its attributes, like a 10 eight, six over there, if you walk up, uh, upwards, it's a composite. If you, if you look downwards, there are other things that of, of these other concepts that has additional properties like being a square and things like that. 
So even composite are only those, and even composite square is only four. So it, it gives you um, a, a very high-level high characterization of all the interconnections and between the lower level binary metrics over there that you can't even you know, see those kind of patterns. So this is very powerful. And I'm going to um, mention this because we're going to use the property. It's a structural property we're going to leverage. That's a lattice property. Okay? A lattice property means that if you're given any nodes, like a one, two there, being a lattice is that if you walk upwards, there's the smallest ancestor sitting on, unique smallest ancestor sit, sitting on top. So the left side represents a lattice fragment. The right hand side, if you have one, two, if you look at one, two, any pair of concept, then one, two, if you walk upwards, there are two minimal ancestor sitting on top of it. And that's not a lattice structure. If we follow the FCA kind of paradigm, you always get something like on the left-hand side. You will never get something on the right-hand side, this kind of property. This is the lattice violating property. And that, that kind of structure actually violating what you can derive from FCA. And this is the one that where FCA is agreed to be a, actually a general mathematical form formulation of what concept is. Okay? So that we better conform to this property. And so if, if we find lat sort of fragments that does not com conform to this property, then we, we may think that there, there's potential, that potential errors and things like there. So the question is, how do we f detect if if something slum a CD, like you know, such a large system, is a lattice or not? And if it's not, how do we find all of the non-lattice fragments so that we can look closer? So this is what um, so we so this is the, the principle that we're going to use. Where structured ontologies are lattices, because every concept can be broken into two aspects: intention and extension. And once you derive that way using the conceptual kind of taxonomy, will be order structure guaranteed to be a lattice that several of other um, researchers in, in the area already also confirm that kind of um, um, principle. Now, so if we agree that with this, this principle, uh, that concept has intention extension, then we are all work at is a hierarchy that is, that is guaranteed to be a lattice. So how do we use this principle? Where what we are facing with uh, ontological structures such as SNOMAS CT is that we already given a, is a hierarchy. So the outcome is already given here. The intention extension is implicit. It's not, not explicitly specified. They, they, they don't give you this kind of metrics, but they give you the result. So then we can ask, is it a lattice or not? If it is not, then there's some problem because it's, it's, it's sort of uh, inconsistent with this principle. So basically, we re-engineer. I mean, what could be re-engineered? And if you can't be re-engineered, re there's a problem there. So what we set to do in 2009, and actually during my sort of uh, couple of months stay, sabbatical at the NLM, collaborating with uh, Olivia Bodenreiter there, <laughs> So we decided to take a closer look at this question because nobody else uh, looked at it before. But if you look at it, we have uh, over 3,000, 300,000 con concepts, those nodes. And if you just uh, compare all of those pairs uh, using brute force, you have 47 billion pairs. And if you just uh, analyze each one of them, you know, assuming reasonable um, time for each of the steps, it'll, it'll take us 15 years okay, to do that. So we actually used a, a, a existing technology at that time using semantic web technology called RDF Sparkle, and uh, then processed the, um, the, the analysis. Um, and it actually sort of, um, f we found that there's a percentage of non-lattice pairs existing in most of the hierarchies. And we want to look at them. We want to analyze them. But that, that was too slow. Uh, when we did that. It, it, it took us three months to complete. But what we want to do is that not only compete, uh, sort of analyze one version, because each year there are two versions. We want to 
sort of analyze each of the version uh, in existing today. And we want to look at how things are changed. That that's reflect the effort that, that uh, the ontology engineers that actually focused on the work in those areas that gets changed. We also want to visualize the change and uh, mining the patterns in those changes. So this uh, MAPO, map, map reduce pipeline for lattice based evaluation, was actually presented um, <coughs> last, um, last fall. And that was a result of actually the, uh, the class, um, ESEC 600 class early on. So we want to leverage Hadoop, HDFS, leverage pre-computed sort of transitive closure, big set operation, and things like that, some of the mathematical properties. I'm going to skip the mathematics part and using examples to illustrate what's actually going on. But basically, this, this is the formula uh, we sort of came up with to compute a non-lattice in, um, in the, in the map-reduced setting. So when we have this kind of structure, we look up um, the upper closure. So the one up and two up and things like that are the things above this particular node. So if you look at two, the three, five, six, seven are everything above it, right? So, and then you can just follow the formula and the compute and you'll get six, seven. That's exactly the minimum common ancestor that two and three has. So that's the content, basically the idea of that, um, of that formula there. But then, because in the process of computing, we repeatedly use the you know, ancestor relationship. Where can you reach from point A to point B? So we better pre-compute that once and for all and reuse that. And that's one of the uh, algorithmic principles. If you need to, to compute something repeatedly, compute it once, save the results, and then, then just call it, just look up, right? So that's a time-saving measure. So this is what the translative closure in general look like. You have a graph kind of structure, and then you can connect anything that's reachable from A to B by a direct link instead of indirect link that you need to walk up one, two, three, four, you know, 30 steps. Now it's one step. 30 steps become one step, okay? So connectivity is immediate, that means. Hopefully our in, you know, network infrastructure can, can be like that. You know, all the connectivity is just one hop away, right? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> uh, so this is actually the, the, the map reduce pipeline. I'm not going to bore you with the, the details here, but basically there, there are two kind of map reduce kind of uh, tasks, and each one involves the key value. Key value, transformation, and key value, basically uh, computing the formula. Once you do that, then we can leverage all sorts of, uh, um, you know, leverage the cloud, cloud computing uh, structure. And we actually um, not only reduce the time from three months to three hours, but also we had a very important discovery that the, if we look at the ontological evolution of different versions, look at the sort of background change in terms, you know, how many new concepts gets added, how many new concepts gets removed, how many relations gets added, how many relations gets removed. So that's a basic kind of rate of change, right? But then we will concentrate on non-lattice areas. What, how many non-lattice, er, you know, fragments gets added, how many non-lattice fragments gets, gets deleted, and things like that. The change rate around non-lattice fragment area is sometimes 40 times more than the baseline change. That means that these are, if you look at a heat map, these are highly you know, uh, hot areas. That means the things are happening in those particular areas. And that's actually one of the you know, validation that, well, we started from very general principle, mathematical principle of former concept analysis, and using that to sort of suggest that all of those structures should have a lattice property, and then you know, detect those violations, and then find out that the violations are actually the way the areas where most of the work has been taking place. And now, so that we, we sort of, without any kind of uh, preconception of what kind of errors there may, may be, we sort of already hone in on those areas that, that are most likely to contain errors. So we should continue to focus on that. And we want to 
not only analyze but to visualize that. So that's the that's the actually um, the pro, one of the programs uh, in my group we're following. So this is a table summarizing the concepts, number, edges, and then actually the, the changes. You know, there's about uh, you know two to six percent of change from year to year in terms of edges added, edges deleted, um, and things like that. So, so, so things do change, but uh, the non lattice area is 40 times more than this that you see here. So we want to visualize in change by comparing one fragment, non lattice fragment. We know we want to look at non lattice fragment. Now we want to visualize that and see what gets, what, what's, what's happening among those. Right, then we can look at from one year, uh, 2013, another year, 2014, of the same sort of fragment error, what gets added, what gets deleted. And in the middle, we have the merged graph that also so that, that actually serves to illustrate very clearly the kind of concepts that's added, the kind of concepts that gets deleted, edges, and things like that. So basically, blue represents the addition, red represents deletion. And with those kind of edits, then you can change from the, the earlier version to the new version. And, and the, the merge graph just shows you exactly what's changed. But then you may notice there, there's a back and forth in the middle that's highlighted in the square uh, rectangle there, reds. You know, there's, there's this phenomenon. So this actually is a problem when we render the graphs, the fragments. You know, when we render a graph, this kind of fragments using well, a, a basic uh, kind of uh, algorithm called a topological sort, so that you can lay out the nodes in this kind of layer by layer way, so they're not, so it's, it's going, the arrows always going upwards, sideways and upwards, and never go downwards. And that's the partial order kind of uh, restriction and confirmation that one must obey to sort of render ordered kind of structure. And when you have this kind of uh, loop in the middle back and forth, that's sort of violating this order. You know, you, you, you go and you go sideways, you go circles. And that, that causes the topological sort for rendering and not terminating. And so that sort of, we, we then set forth to sort of detect it where, what, what are the, how can those kind of back and forth loop can be caused? What could it cause them? So the cause actually is because of the reversal of relation. So you could have one version, you know, 2013 again. So the joint structure of shoulder girder is a joint structure of shoulder region going that way. This is the, you know, this means snowman CT. And then in the later version, you have the reverse. You have the shoulder region is a shoulder girder going in the opposite direction. Well, when we merge these two versions, of view, view it in one sort of graph, you will see what's in the, in, uh, down there. That, that induces a circle. So to detect circle, it's really detecting the reversers, re re relation reversers from one version to another. Where also, relation reversers re sort of represents, a, a, you can say it's a dramatic change. You, you know, A is B becomes B is A. You can also say that it's very confusing. A is B, B is A, right? right? Uh, you know, maybe it's not easy to, to, to sort of see that. So now we want to capture all the reversers between all the versions, right? Because we want to compare any two versions and see what's changed. So the computational challenge now becomes, well, what, we, what, what I show in the previous slide is sort of a direct reversal. It's uh, A is a B, B is A, but you can have several steps along the way in one direction, several steps on the way in the other direction. You can still form a bigger cycle, right, that way. We want to avoid that also. So we want to detect not only direct reversers, but also indirect reversers from versions. And we also compare, need to compare all different versions, not just the immediate next release, because the the kind of pattern below can happen. You can have in one version it says A is a B, and then in the next version A and B are not related anymore. And then in the future version B is reversed to A. You can have those. And those kind of requirements to have to exhaustively capture all of those possibilities 
really presents a computational challenge. That demands us to sort of use the map reduce and um, cloud computing paradigm to sort of perform the computation. And we, again, um, need to use map reduce to scale up the uh, computation. So direct indirect reversal, we use translative closure. Again, I mentioned translative closure. And then the, to capture all the neutral intermediate steps, and when we look at the eight versions and see how things uh, change, then we need to compare e any of the possible ones. So eight times seven divided by two, that's, that's, you know, that's the number of comparisons of the versions we need to have to, to, to actually find, find those. Then we use MapReduce to reduce the process in time. And this is actually the specific kind of MapReduce algorithms. I mentioned uh, that the key value pair for translative closure is like you, for, for a concept, you just walk upwards and collect all the upper neighborhoods. And then, then you, just, you actually sort of reassemble them to get, get pairs out. Reversal dissection is actually a big set operation. You have translative closure of one version. You actually reverse the translative closure of the other version and do a join, a set intersecting and find what's there. And what is there you find are reversers. And these are the two MapReduce algorithms. So what we found, we actually found not quite a lot of reversers, 48 of them. But each of the reversal caused problem, um, causes the rendering to non-terminate. So, and it happens, each of the reverses can happen in many, many non-lattice fragments also. So that's why we, want, we need to detect those before the rendering. And uh, this is the distribution of reversers in different versions. And you can see, here are some of the examples of actual reversers. So flybite is a mosquito bite in one version, but in the other version, mosquito bite is a flybite. It's also confusing if you think about it, which is which, right? Uh, it's a little bit of confusing. So, the highlighted um, um, words there represents what's changed from, uh, from one, uh, one concept node to the other one. So it's, it's just a little bit of a change. And then one must figure out the easy relation, which way, which one is more general, the, which one is more specialized. So, so that's the, you know, once we capture reversals, we can render those algorithms without uh, causing any non-termination. But we're also interested in sort of comparing. Now we have a computational infrastructure. We can ask bigger questions. We can say, well, this ontological structure models certain domain. The other one also models um, similar domain. Now we want to sort of align them together. Do they model things in the same way? Do they have inconsistencies? If they do, even though I am not expert, but they, both of them, then you're posing the problem, you're inconsistent. It's not my so saying this is right and that's wrong. But you can't both be right. That's the, that's the message, right? So we set out to compare uh, SNOMED CT with foundational model of anatomy. That the the right-hand side is a part of the foundational model of anatomy that's about um, all the phenotypes of the human body, right? And uh, this is about the heart uh, chamber, uh, structure in the heart chamber, how the physicians uh, think about the structure of the heart chamber. And SNOMED CT is uh, on the left. And we want to actually, again, this is the task of merging them and then see what gets changed. And in the process in getting insight about, you know, um, where are the inconsistencies? Where are the missing concepts or missing edges? And, and things like that. So I'm, I'm not going to explain each of the you know, coloring in detail, but this is, you know, we have, a, this is actually a rendered, um, automatically rendered diagram. And talking about the visualization, this is not a high, you know, this is not a terribly high resolution, but the structure, the coloring uh, is so important. And to automatically render this kind of structure is actually um, very useful and non-trivial. And we actually use a tool called a D3. .js. Uh, how many of you have heard about D3.js? All right, a couple of them. This is a very cool visualization sort of tool. I encourage everybody to look at it. If you have some data you want to present in a data-driven documentation way. So it, it, it can dynamically present your data in the ways you, you, you haven't probably imagined before. 
And, and we use D3GS for, for all of those uh, presentations. So this is a summary of the result. We compare some by CT and FMA, how many equivalent concepts, how many actually the relations are actually matched, how many are ma mismatched. There are over nearly 6,000 mismatched uh, relations. Like you have the same concepts that's recognized to be equivalent uh, by UMS actually mapping. And it's asserted as ESA in SNOMED CT, but it's other kinds of relation in FMA. Okay, so this is a disparity about uh, between FMA and SNOMED CT, where we also were interested, curious about the structural differences because in general, SNOMED CT is not a lattice as I already shown, but FMA is required to be a tree to begin with. So tree is always lattice and it's actually a very special kind of lattice. So the structurally they are set out to be sort of uh, not consistent to begin with. There has to be something wrong, um, one or the other, right? So the, the question is, you know, how do we analyze and how do we find out? So to summarize, <clears throat> so with cloud computing, um, we can achieve several magnitudes of speed up. And when we can speed up things, in such a dramatic way, so we don't have to wait for three months to, uh, to, uh, for the computation to complete, and it only takes three hours. Now we can ask bigger questions. We can, we can analyze not just a single version and focus that and uh, wait for three months, but we can ask uh, you know, all sorts of versions because each version only takes a couple of hours, right? Then we can look at the change um, between different versions, so visualizing ev evolution of ontological systems. So it's really, transforming the existing um, ontological analysis method from a, a small kind of example-based one to a systematic large-scale one. It has never been done before in the community. So we are the first to actually take this cloud computing big data kind of paradigm, using it and applying it to the ontological quality assurance area. And um, so, I'm gonna sort of conclude first, and if I have a little bit of time, I can actually sort of show the, how the interface look like, and if the, if the con network connectivity is, <laughs> is okay, or if our server is okay, and I have a local version also. So I, I mentioned at the beginning, we, you know, we have the basic uh, you know, uh, sort of access of volume, velocity, and variety, and I think that vision and values is actually more important for big data. Okay, and that's actually what's the most important thing that people care about big data. So I think big data is a, a frame of mind. So a, a bigger vision so, so that you can perceive the scientific landscape from a grander data scale. And that's important by the scalability of cloud computing such as MapReduce to map for massively parallel processing. So when you can complete your computation in much shorter time, you can devote your time for more important tasks such as analysis and writing and publications and things like that. So you don't have to you know, wait uh, for the computation before you can analyze them. Um, so this is, this is a, a, a picture of um, students and other researchers in my group and they did most of the actual programming work and uh, really enjoyed working with them and several of them are, are actually sitting around in the room here and uh, great job. And then um, I have collaborators on, on different kinds of projects. So ontological engineering, this quality assurance analysis is just one sort of, uh, um, one sort of area that we're pursuing and hopefully in the not too long future we're, we'll be able to actually attract uh, funding specifically to support this work. Right now it's sort of experimental and generating preliminary results and things like that. But my other kind of work, um, um, such as uh, Center for Soda Research, uh, National Sleep Research, so these are funded um, uh, projects already. If you look at the website, we have a website talking about how to use ontological driven architecture to actually develop applications that's used by clinicians, physicians, and uh, researchers. Um, from different multiple academic medical centers working collaboratively together. 
And uh, you know, last and not least, again, and you know, uh, thanks for the uh, ITS support for providing the Cloudera cloud computing environment, and that's a set that provided uh, you know thanks particularly for Hadron to sort of manage that environment so that the students can sort of have a very interesting playground to experiment with different ideas, different algorithms, and then we can refine them. And, you know, so, so I think uh, that's, that's an important resource for us uh, to leverage, not by myself, but hopefully I show, a, I have demonstrated a particular example how valuable that resource could be. And I encourage everybody to sort of rethink your research paradigm. And if you can ask bigger questions, don't worry about the computational story. Where do I put there? How long does it take? Just think bigger first. And then the resources will be there. You will find things that will help you to achieve those. So I think that's, um, that's pretty much um, I want to share for, for now. Thanks. Yes. So, um, Chris. Yeah. If I understand right, I don't know anything about this. But you're you're finding the mistakes in their ontology, and eventually, if the mistakes are fixed, then the experts who keep uh, changing the ontology year by year and making their individual changes. So, thanks. So, at some point, when the expert to make his change where he decides, okay, we need to add some new term or some new relationship, then you're going to have, I presume, a system that's going to check the new change that he adds to the ontology. And my question is, when this expert adds his new node or his new term or his new relationship, is it going to take the same amount of time? Do you have to check the entire um, ontological database all over again to look for these non-lattice structures, or is it faster in that case? Um, so there are a couple of things, actually. There are an interesting sort of, um, um, you know, very good question. The sort of what we've done here is actually the analytics side to find novel principles that can be applied to that setting, um, and that's not limited in scope. But then whatever we find, that we make recommendations to the, actually the owners of those ontological systems who they may, they may or may not accept those changes. Some of the changes they, they will accept immediately. Others may, may take a while because sometimes it's not a single person decision. It's a commun community in this community uh, decision. So, but then the ontological analysis, it's sort of, um, uh, you always go back to analyze. Um, you don't, uh, we don't necessarily uh, go back and say, did you change this or did you change that? But then we present that, you know, here are the things that are still inconsistent. Uh, maybe you reduced, uh, you know, errors in this error, but you, you may introduce new ones. So it's an it's, it's a ecosystem. It's, it's a life cycle um, um, for the pipeline. It's, it's not that you, you analyze it, recommend it, and that's it. It's a continual process. Let's say that um, you're at a state where they've fixed whatever inconsistencies that you've identified. So now they have a, you know, a, a system that, where everything is fixed. And now they want to add, let's say, a new relationship. Right now, you can, you can check everything in, you said, three minutes or, or three hours, right? Uh, if they add one new relationship, will it take you three hours in order to verify that you don't have a new non-lattice structure? Where, so the, the, so the, the kind of approach that's taken is not, uh, you know, just look at the what's changed because uh, there may be multiple changes in different places and uh, that's not effective as actually just, uh, you know, do a thorough analysis because, um, um, <clears throat> because sometimes if they change one place, it may affect many other places. It's not isolated change that you can isolate. This is the only thing. And actually, those kind of changes are, um, are not, you know, many cases it's just thousands of uh, places that gets changed. So it's not so sort of cost effective even just zeroing on the change in the areas. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions?
Hi. Oh, sorry. I had a question about slide 35, I think it was. It was a results slide. Um, there's a table there with concepts, edges, non-lattice pairs, and the computation time. Um, in 2009, the time was around 10,000 seconds, and that spikes up to 74,000 seconds the following year, and then comes back down to 6K. Um, I was wondering, do you know why that spike was there? Um, there was, um, that was around a time, actually, where a chunk of things got moved to a different area. So actually, there was an explanation for why there was a change. You know, we, 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 we first just let the computation tell what's the story, but then asked the experts like uh, Olivia and, you know, Borden Rider, and he then said, wow, that, that's exactly, you know, a chunk of things gets moved around. And that explains those uh, spikes. Yeah, I thought so. Going yeah. from three hours to 19 hours, or yeah. it yeah. seemed significant. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, let's thanks again, uh, JQ. Uh,